ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله وصحبه حق قدره ومقداره العظيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم فاللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا ووفقنا للعمل فيما يضيك عنا بجاه نبيك الأكرم صلى الله عليه وسلم وبسر الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord of the heavens and the earth. We ask him to send his peace, blessings and rest upon our master, our guide, the coolness of our eyes, the strength of our hearts. Sayyiduna wa Mawlana Muhammad al-Mustafa, the chosen one upon his blessed household, his loyal companions, and all of those who followed after them with excellence up until the day of standing. Amina, amina, amin. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us and given us, given us life to live through the blessed month of Sha'ban al-Mu'azzam, the month of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, the month in which he sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam would fast the most uh, other than Ramadan. And some say that he sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam would fast Sha'ban such that he would connect it to Ramadan and he would fast two months. Uh, running sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and one of the reasons why he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose the month of Sha'ban because he said this is a month between Rajab and Ramadan that is neglected by people this is a month between Rajab and Ramadan which is neglected by people and he gave life sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam to a month that was neglected a time that was neglected the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would give life to that time he would revive that time sallallahu alaihi wasallam and if we look into the sunnah prayers uh, that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would pray those that were besides the sunnah prayers connected to the fard prayers so besides the sunnah prayers that are connected to the fard prayers if we look at the times in which he sallallahu alaihi wasallam would pray those particular prayers, they were at times when people would neglect those times, at times when people would be heedless of those times. So for example, the hundred time when everyone is asleep, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would arise and he would give life to that time. Likewise, duha time, mid-morning time when people are busy in their businesses, when the sun has risen, and people uh, go out into their worldly affairs and are busy in their businesses, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa he would uh, revive that particular time with the duha prayer, with the mid-morning prayer. And he Sallallahu Alaihi wa sallam, he said, the one who prays four rak'at of duha, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will take care of the rest of his day for him. The one who prays four rak'at of duha, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala takes care of the rest of his day. Likewise, between Maghrib and Isha, what do people get up to? Between Maghrib and Isha, people are busy eating their food. Ramadan is coming, right? The banquets will be laid out, and as uh, soon as Maghrib Adhan is said, people are to food. The Prophet wasallam, he would revive this time. He would give life to this time by praying the six rak'at of Awabin in between. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he would revive time, give life to time, and use his time usefully and constructively, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, especially times that people would neglect. Especially times that people would neglect. Likewise, the month of Sha'ban, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he saw that people neglect this month between Rajab and Ramadan. Rajab is from the Ashur al hurum from the sacred months. And there are four sacred months. Minha, Allah said in the Quran, Minha arba'atun hurum. From amongst the 12 months, there are four months that are sacred. And one of those sacred months is the month of Rajab. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Rajab shahrullah. Rajab is the month of Allah. Ramadan shahru ummati. Ramadan is the month of my ummah. And Sha'ban shahri. Sha'ban is my month. Sha'ban is my month. And he said, this is a month in which people neglect their worship. Their worship. So he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam named this particular month after himself to honor this month, 
to revive this man, to give life to this man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But not only for that reason. That's the reason that he explained to us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the reason that he explicitly explained to us in his blessed words sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But there is a reason which is greater that he sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam didn't speak about but wanted all of us to work it out for ourselves. Rubba isharatin ablahu min al kalam. As they say, that may be an indication, may be an indication towards something is greater in reaching than actually speaking out. Than actually speaking out. Sometimes when you give an indication to someone, they understand greater than if you had explained that in words. And like the poet said, Inna al labiba yafhamu. Uh, that the intelligent person understands with an indication, understands with an ishara. You give them an indication and they click on, they know exactly what to do. They don't need a long speech, they don't need you to instruct them with words. Likewise, the Prophet وسلم, he saw this ummah to be an intelligent ummah. So there was much that he وسلم, was silent about so that his ummah can work it out. Is that clear? So what was the point that he wanted to uh, wanted all of us to work out? That he is the uslatun bayn al-ibadi wa rabbihim. That he is the connecting point between the creation and the creator, Jalla Jalaluhu. That he is the uh, he is the usla. He is the connecting point. Right? So if Ramadan is our month, the month of the ummah, and Rajab is the month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in between is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So he is the usla. He's the connecting point between the creation and the Creator Jalla Jalalu. Without him, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam, there is no reaching to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He is that essential bridge. He is that essential connecting point. Without whom, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is no arrival to our destination. And what's our destination? Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala spoke about our destination in Surah Al Najm, and He said, Wa anna ila rabbika muntaha. And the end point is to your Lord. The end destination is the divine subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he is a manifestation of the mercy of the divine subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the manifestation of the perfection that Allah azza wa jal placed in creation. And he's the pinnacle of that sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And beyond him is the absolute divine jalla jalalu. And it is He, Jalla Jalaluhu, the Divine Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, who is the destination. Who is the destination. For when we reach the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what does He do Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He takes by our hand and He takes us to the door of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He takes us to the door of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Is that clear? So we praise Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for the month of Rajab. And we ask Him Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to increase all of us uh, from the blessings of the Prophet Sallallahu in his blessed month, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Okay, in the previous lesson, the great Imam, Muhaddis of the Haramain al-Sharifain, Al-Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi bin Abbas bin Abdul Aziz, Al-Maliki al-Makki al-Hasani, radiyallahu anhu wa nafa'anallahu bihi wa bikum, Allah benefit us from his knowledge, Ameen. <coughs> We're speaking about the blessed sight of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. And the, the important point that we dwelled upon in the previous lesson was that he sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was khafidat tarf that his blessed sight was constantly lowered sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His blessed sight was constantly lowered. And what was mentioned is that this is what the believing person has to train himself and herself in in keeping the, the sight lowered so that uh, it does not capture haram. It does not pick up haram or that which is disliked. For if it picks up haram or that which is disliked, then an imprint of that will reach the heart and destroy the heart, corrupt the heart. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, when a believing person commits a sin, what happens? A black spot, a black dot is placed on the heart. And if he commits another sin, another black dot is placed. If he commits another sin, another black dot is placed such that if he constantly continues in sins, then the entire heart is blackened. 
Once the entire heart is blackened, what happens then? Then a person becomes spiritually senseless. A person becomes spiritually senseless. We have our outer senses. So we have the sense of touch. Right? Young children, what do they do? They rush for the fire. Right? They rush for the fire. Regardless of how much you tell them it's hot, it's hot, it's hot. Because they see this exciting flame, they want to go touch it. Right? And as soon as they arrive close to it, they feel the heat of this blaze and then they retract. Because they have a sense in their hand, because of this sense of touching in their hands, they realize this is fire, this is not to play with. Likewise, our spirits, likewise, our souls, they have senses. Right? And when we sin, those senses become weak. And when we do righteous deeds, those senses become more powerful. They become strong and more powerful. An example of an extremely strength, uh, an extremely powerful as Shaykh Abdul Karim ibn Hawazi al Qushayri radiallahu an, one of the greatest Imams of the science of the Tasawwuf radiallahu an. He mentions in the biography of one of the great awliya that he writes about uh, in the beginning of his book, Al Risala. He said, This particular friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever he would extend his hand, to food, whenever he would extend his hand to food. If that particular food, if that particular food was haram or it was doubtful, if that particular food was haram or it was doubtful, then a vein in his hand would begin to pop. A vein in his hand would begin to pop and then he would retract his hand and not eat that food. How would this happen? How would this occur? Because the sense his spiritual sense was so pure, so clean, that his spiritual sense would send signals to his uh, physical senses. Would send signals to the physical senses. Likewise, when our spiritual senses are intact, clean, pure, then they send uh, signals to the eye. That there's no need for you to roam around with your eyes. Keep your eye lowered. But what does our eye, our physical eye work upon? It works upon the spiritual sense. When, when the spiritual sense is healthy, the signals that come to the eye are healthy. When the spiritual sense is weak and ill and diseased, the signals that arrive to the physical sense are also diseased are also ill, is that clear? Are also diseased and also ill. <coughs> so therefore, what's important, and both the spiritual and the physical sense, they work hand in hand. They work with each other. They uh, cooperate with each other. So, the spiritual sense says to the physical sense, so long as you do not look at haram, I will stay healthy. And the spiritual sense says to the physical sense, says to the physical sense, so long as you do not look at haram, I will stay healthy. And then what, will, what happens to the physical sense? That the spiritual sense sends out good signals to the, to the physical sense of the eye. So they work with each other and they cooperate with each other. Likewise the hearing. Likewise the hearing. So long as we protect our hearing from haram, our spiritual sense will stay healthy and good. When we expose our physical hearing to haram, then our spiritual hearing becomes weak. And there is nothing to send signals to it. There is nothing to send signals to it. Now sometimes what happens is we're not immune of sin. The Prophet said, Adam all of the children of Adam make mistakes. Khatta often make mistakes. And the best of those who make mistakes are whom? The best of those who make mistakes are the ones who repent after them. Are those who repent 
after them. And the Prophet ﷺ said in one hadith that if you did not commit sins, Imam al Nawawi mentions this in Riyadh al-Salihin radiallahu anhu. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you did not commit sins, if you did not make mistakes, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have replaced you with a people who commit sins, make mistakes, and make tawbah after them. Why? Not because Allah likes us making mistakes, but rather Allah loves the act of tawbah. Allah loves the act of tawbah, repentance. This is why from amongst those people who Allah Azza wa Jal loves and his, has declared His love for in the Quran al Karim, there are about eight. There are about eight categories of people whom Allah Subhanahu wa Taala declares his, his love for in the Quran al Karim. So, from amongst those around about eight categories of people whom He declares His love for, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in Surah Al Baqarah, "Inna Allah yuhibbu al wa yuhibbu al mutatahirin." Allah says. Surely Allah loves the oft repenters. The oft repenters, number one. المتطهرين, and He loves those who exaggerate in purification, in purifying themselves physically and purifying themselves spiritually. So, Tawbah, repentance, and purification come hand in hand. People who physically purify themselves, they will spiritually purify themselves. But those who do not bother about their physical purity, they won't bother about their spiritual purity. This is why one of the great awliya, radiallahu anhu, he said, from after when I met my spiritual teacher, my teacher who taught me this religion, he said, from the day that I met my teacher who began to teach me this religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, from that day, till this day, and he, he reached a very old age. He said, from that day to this day, I have never stayed in the state when I've never had wudu. I've always been in the state of ritual purity. Always been in the state of ritual purity of wudu. Why? Because the wudu is silahul mu'min. It's the weapon of the believing person against the shaitan. It's the protection that a believing person can protect themselves with against the shaitan. People who stay in, in the state of wudu, they stay in protection from the shaitan. But people who are not in the state of wudu, then they expose themselves. They have given a leeway to the shaitan to come and attack them. Why? Because the shaitan loves impurities. The shaitan lives in impurities. This is why when we enter into uh, the, uh, the toilet, the dua that is made is what? Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubusi wal khabais. Oh Allah, I seek refuge from you, from the male and the female shaitans. I seek refuge from you, in you from the male and female shaitans. Why? Where do they live? They live in the toilets. They live in places of najasa, places of filth. This is why the Prophet وسلم, encourages us to stay in a state of wudu so that we are not in a state of impurity if we stay in a state of physical purity the effect and impact of that physical in, uh, purity will come onto our spiritual purity is that clear? so the Shaykh radiallahu an was speaking about the blessed sight of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam and he spoke about khafidu uh, al that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam constantly kept his blessed sight lowered in teaching all of us as to how we should keep our sight and how we should keep our gaze lowered and pure from impurities. Likewise, the blessed hearing of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was not like the hearing of any other human being. For Imam Tirmidhi and Imam Ibn Majah radiallahu anhuma both narrate from Sayyiduna Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu and Imam Abu Nu'im narrates from Hakim ibn Hizam Hakim ibn Hizam was the cousin of Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha and he was a wise person they narrate from Hakim ibn Hizam radiallahu anhuma that they said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam said 
تسمعون ما أسمع do you hear what I hear قالوا ما نسمع من شيء they said we don't hear anything O Messenger of Allah and the Prophet said إني أرى إني لا أرى ما لا ترون وأسمع ما لا تسمعون the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said to the companions for surely I see that which you do not see and I hear that which you do not hear and then the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said إني أسمع أطيط السماء وما تلام أنت إط وما فيها موضع شبر إلا وعليه ملك ساجد أو قائم the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم explain to them the extent and the power and the strength of his blessed hearing and he said I can hear I can hear the sound of the heavens right I can hear the sound of the heavens and and what type of sound is this when he said and you know when you sit on a chair a wooden chair uh, when you sit on it, it goes like this sound the Prophet said, I can hear this sound for the heavens. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and why should it not make this sound? For there isn't a hand spun in the heavens except that there is an angel either standing and praying or making such that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? In another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Uh, rather Sayyidina Zayd ibn Thabit, the great companion, Zayd ibn Thabit was one of the great scholars from amongst the Sahaba. Because not everyone had the opportunity to come and sit with the Prophet وسلم, and learn from him. But nevertheless, they were all companions. Nevertheless, if the entire Ummah, the first of them and the last of them, all gather together in their piety, righteousness and goodness, none of them can reach the rank, the status, and the value of one companion of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because of the sharaf, the honor of seeing the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The scholars of hadith, they define a companion as who? Someone who saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, someone who saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if it was once and then died upon Iman and then died upon Iman. And our teacher Habib Ali, he said, this is the definition that the scholars of Hadith mention of a Sahabi, that someone who, someone who saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then died as a companion. He said, the friends of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the awliya, they have a different definition. They said that it, they, they said that the group of the companions, they did not reach that level of companionship and that rank and status of goodness and righteousness and piety because they gazed upon the prophetic face but rather it was because the prophetic sight fell upon them. It was rather because the prophetic sight fell upon them sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he sallallahu alayhi wasallam looked towards them and they became people of honor. They became people of goodness and they became people of righteousness. Sayyidina Zayd ibn Sabit radiyallahu anhi said Bayna al-Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam ala baqlatin lahu iz haadat bihi fakadat tulqihi wa iza aqburu sab'atin aw khamsatin aw arba'a Sayyidina Zayd said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was mounted upon his his animal he was mounted upon an animal and he was riding that this animal began to shake and it was about to throw the Prophet ﷺ off its back. Sayyidina Zayn said, besides that area where the, where, where the animal was about to throw the Prophet ﷺ off, they were either six or five or four graves. And the Prophet said, Man ya'rifu ashab hadhi al Who knows the people of these graves? Who knows the people of these graves? And a man said, Anna. Someone said, I do. And the Prophet said, Mata mata haula. When did they die? <coughs> and the Prophet, uh, the man said, Matu fil ishraq. They died in a state of shirk. They died in a state when they were associating partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet said, Inna hadhi al ummah tubtala fi qubuliha. 
He said, these people are being tried and tested in their graves. فَلَوْلَا أَنْ لَا تَدَافَنُوا لَدَعُوتُ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ أَنْ يُسْمِعَكُمْ مِنْ عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ الَّذِي أَسْمَعُ The Prophet ﷺ said, this ummah is tried and tested even after their death in their graves. And then he said to the companions, if I did not fear, if I did not fear that you would stop burying your dead ones, I would have prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow you to hear the punishment of the graves the way I can hear it. I would have asked Allah to allow you to hear the punishment of the graves the way I hear the punishment of the graves. He said, but I fear that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to hear the punishment of the graves, then you wouldn't bury your dead ones. You would not bury your dead ones. But what do we learn from this hadith? What do we learn from this hadith? That the animal that the Prophet ﷺ was mounted upon, it felt and sensed the punishment of this grief. It felt and it sensed the punishment of the people of this grief. Then tell me, if the impact, then tell me, if the impact and the effect and the torment of a grave of a disbeliever can be felt by an animal, tell me, can can the blessings of the grave of a believing person not be felt by the people of Iman? Why not? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing out the torment of the grave and making this animal feel it and sense it such that it shook so much that he was about to throw the Prophet off its back, then tell me, cannot the, can the believing person not feel the blessings the rahmah, the maghfirah that is descending upon the believing place, people's grief? Indeed, they can. For the Prophet ﷺ was approached by a companion who said, Ya Rasulullah, last night I struck my tent upon the ground and from within my tent I heard the recitation of Surah Tabarak, Tabarak alladhi biyadihi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadeen. I was frightened. Ya Rasulullah, I was frightened. And the Prophet sallallahu said, did you, know, did you not know that you, had struck, that you had struck your tent on top of the grave of such and such a companion who was reciting Quran in his grave? Which means what? That as the punishment and the torment of the graves of the disbelievers can be felt, likewise the tranquility, the peace, the uh, mercy and the the, the mercy and the forgiveness that descends to the graves of the believing people can also be felt. Can also be felt. This is why the believing people go and visit the graves of their relatives. This is why they go and visit the graves of the Salihin and the Awliya and the scholars of Islam. Why? Because we have husnul zan with these people. We have husnul zan with the Awliya. We have husnul zan with the Ulama. We have husnul zan with the Shuhada. We have husnul zan with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does husnul zan mean? We have good thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who dressed these people in the dress of goodness, righteousness upon the earth will also give these people in their graves goodness and forgiveness such that the blessings of that goodness and forgiveness is spread to those who attend their graves. Those who come and give them salam. Why do we go to the grave of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Why? Because of the immense blessings that are at his blessed grave sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Every morning, seventy thousand angels descend to my grave and send blessings upon me. Up until the evening, when those seventy thousand rise, and Allah subhanahu wa taala sends another seventy thousand to my grave, and they send peace and blessings up unto uh, 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 me until the morning." The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, That the angels, they take turns in descending to the earth and rising back up to the heavens. When do the angels come down and go back up? At two times. At Fajr time and at Asr time. The angels that come down to the earth at, uh, at Fajr time, their duty ends at Asr time. They rise and another group of angels descend down to the earth at Asr time and their duty ends at Fajr time. 
Is it clear? So we have angels coming down from the heavens to the earth all day long. And 140,000 angels at the grave of the Prophet وسلم, every single day. And the Prophet وسلم, said, an angel that comes once will never ever have a turn again. An angel that comes once will never ever have a turn again to come back to my grave. So you understand the amount of angels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates to come down to the grave of the Prophet وسلم, every single day. So, when the believing people visit the graves of the ulama, the graves of the awliya, the graves of the righteous, what do we expect from those graves? We expect that the mercy of Allah that is descending upon this grave, the forgiveness of Allah that is descending upon this grave, the tranquility uh, that is descending upon this grave, we will also have a portion of that forgiveness, mercy and tranquility because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna rahmatallahi Surely the mercy of Allah is close to the people of goodness. Whether they are upon the earth or in their graves. Whether they are upon the earth or in their graves, Allah's mercy is close to them. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said that if I did not fear that you'd stop burying your deceased ones, I would have prayed to Allah to allow you to hear what's happening in the graves. Is that clear? Sayyiduna Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, this young companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he said, Dakhala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam hayatan min hitan al-Madina li bani al-Najjar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went into a garden from the gardens of Medina, which belonged to the tribe of Banu al-Najjar. Banu al-Najjar were relatives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fasami'a aswadan, aswata qawmin yu'adhabun. And he heard Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the sound of a people who are being punished fi quburihim in their graves. Fahasat al-Baghla. And the animal that he was boarding upon, it began to shake. Fasal al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet asked, Mata dufinu Mata dufina hadha? When were these people buried? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, Dufina Hada fil Jahiliya. This person was buried in the days of ignorance. He was buried in the days of ignorance. When the Prophet ﷺ heard that, he said the same thing that he said in the previous hadith. He said, If I did not fear that you would stop burying your dead ones, I would have asked Allah to allow you to hear the punishment and the trauma of the graves. So the question that Imam al Shami. Radiallahu an Imam Muhammad bin Yusuf al Salihi al Shami. Imam Muhammad bin Yusuf, he wrote one of the one of the largest encyclopedias on the Prophet's life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of my favorite books. Right? This book is an encyclopedia on the Prophet's life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's in about 12 or 13 volumes this size. 12 or 13 volumes of this size. He wrote an encyclopedia on the Prophet sallam's life. And he was from Damascus, an area known as Salihiyya. An area known as Salihiyya, uh, which comes from righteousness, Salah. Why was this area known as Salihiyya? Because this area was always full of pious and righteous people. Always full of pious and righteous people. What did he say? He said, if someone asks the question, how is it possible that one individual can hear a sound how is it possible that one individual can hear a sound that is not heard by another individual who is standing besides him and he has no defect in his hearing? And he has no defect in his hearing. So if I hear a sound or if some, one individual hears a sound that is not heard by another person, how is it possible? So the question is, how is it possible that the Prophet wasallam heard the sound of punishment in these graves whilst people around him who had no defect in their hearings could not hear that. What's the answer? And he, he replies and he says, Ujib, I answer this question. The Imam radiallahu anhu said, he said, Hearing, hearing, or grasping, grasping a sound 
or realizing a sound, realizing a sound, realizing a sound, realizing a sound is a understanding and a phenomena that Allah Azza wa Jal creates. Realizing a sound is a phenomena that Allah Azza wa Jal creates. And it's not with our nature that we can hear. It's not by our nature that we can hear. Let's give an example of that. Glass of water. I'm feeling thirsty. Right? Glass of what? Water? I'm feeling thirsty. If I drink this water, will my thirst be quenched? What do you think? Huh? Glass of water. Let's test your Aqida lesson today. Yeah? Glass of water. If I, I'm feeling thirsty now. If I drink it, will my uh, thirst be quenched by drinking the water? <coughs> Who says yes? Raise your hand if you say yes. Okay, so who doesn't know? That's good. Okay, who said? Okay, we're okay. We're clear now. Bismillah. <laughs> I drank. And my thirst is quenched now. Was it the water that quenched my thirst? Was it the water that quenched my thirst? Who quenched my thirst? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in need of water to quench my thirst? Or can he quench my thirst without water? He can quench my thirst without water subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So let's have an aqeedah lesson now. Let's have an aqeedah lesson. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this enormous universe. Within this enormous universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed something known as asbab. Placed something known as? Speak up, people. I don't want you to forget this lesson. This is too important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this enormous universe and He placed within it something known as Asbab. And what does Asbab mean? It means means. It means means. Reasons and means. So, uh, one of the means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in this world is water. Water is a means to quenching thirst, it is not the quencher of thirst, right? Likewise, fire is a means of heat and it's a means of burning, but it is not the burner and it is not the heater. Uh, likewise, medicine. Medicine is a means. When we take paracetamol, is it the paracetamol that, uh, that soothes our headache? No, it is a means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who creates cure and shifa. Shifa is in Allah's hand. Sometimes we take medicine and we're cured, and sometimes we don't take medicine and we're cured. Sometimes we'll take medicine for years and years and years and we're not cured. Is that clear? So, asbab that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in this world. He has placed them so that we approach those asbab. Allah wants us to approach those asbab. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know that these asbab and means, they do not have impact within themselves. They do not have impact within themselves. This is why the scholars of Aqeedah, they say, Al-akhdu bil asbab wajibun that to take by means is wajib, is a must. But to also negate any impact and effect that that sabab, that means can have is also wajib. So if we say water is the quencher of our thirst, we've made a big mistake. Because sometimes we can drink and drink and drink and our thirst is not quenched. And sometimes we don't drink and our thirst is quenched. Like Sayyidina Muawiyah this great companion of the Prophet he would eat and eat and eat and he would never get filled. And he'd say to his companion, he said, pick up this food, I'm tired but I'm not full. I'm tired of eating but I'm not full. Is that clear? Right? So, likewise, our hearing is a sabab. It's a means. 
Our ear is a means. Is it that our ear allows us to hear? Or is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we use the sense of hearing, when we use the sense of our ear, the sense of hearing, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates that sound for us. It's not our ear. Because there might be a time when a sound occurs, but our ear does not hear it. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want our ear to hear it. Like the example of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. They threw him in fire, but did he burn? No. Why? Because the fire cannot burn with its own power. When we have fire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wants, he creates the impact and effect of burning. But if he wants, he won't create the impact and effect of burning. Likewise, Musa alayhi salam crossed through the Nile, did he drown? No. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed for the Nile to part. And he did not drown. Is that clear? So, we take by means. We take by means. But for the effect of those means to occur, only occurs if Allah Azza wa Jal wants it to occur. Like the example, a woman came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and complained to her. Right? A woman came to the Prophet Sallallahu and complained to her about a particular matter. Sayyida Aisha was sitting there and she did not hear anything. Sayyida Aisha was sitting there and she did not hear anything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this at the beginning of the 28th juz. Allah said, قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهُ right? Sayyida Aisha was sitting there, she said, I didn't hear anything that she said to the Prophet ﷺ. Even though Sayyida Aisha had no defects in her hearing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want for that sound to reach her hearing. Is that clear? So, how is it that one individual can hear a sound and another individual who is standing beside him and his hearing is intact does not hear that sound? Because our ears are only means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of effect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of impact. If Allah wants, he creates an impact for one person that he does not create for another. Is that clear? He creates an impact and effect for one person that he does not create for another. Like one of the great awliya in Damascus, Sheikh Ahmed Harun Rahmatullahi Ali, it was known, it's still known, there's still people who, who met the Shaykh and who lived with the Shaykh, right? I think he passed away in the 70s. Sheikh Ahmed Harun was an unlettered wali of Allah. He never studied in a school or in a madrasa. He never studied in a school or a madrasa. Uh, he was a normal person whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught. He taught him such. He used to be the cleaner in a masjid known as Jami' Zayd ibn Sabit radiallahu anhu. The masjid of Sayyidina Zayd ibn Sabit radiallahu anhu. He used to be the cleaner of the masjid. And after being the cleaner, he became the mufassir of the masjid. He used to teach tafsir of the Quran al -Kareem. And great scholars of Damascus used to attend his lessons, including our teacher, the great faqih, the great mutakallim, the great uh, allama, Shaykh Muhammad Adim Kallas rahmatullah alayhi, used to sit in his lessons. Right? Great scholars of Damascus used to sit in his lessons. Right? And some of the things the Shaykh used to do was extremely fun. Uh, back in the days, they didn't have mobile phones. So what did he do? He pulled out his landline, right? He pulled out his landline and he would tie the line uh, around his waist, right? Tie it around his waist. And he would carry the receiver in his hand. Anytime he wanted to speak to someone, he used to punch in the number and speak on the receiver. And the other person used to pick up the phone at home and speak to the shaykh. This was one of the karamat, one of the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. Is that clear? That was Shaykh Ahmad al Harun, one of our teachers, Shaykh Abu Sulaiman al Zabibi, one of the senior teachers of Al Fatih al Islami. He said, one day he was out, Shaykh Abu Sulaiman al Zabibi. He said, one day I was out on a picnic with, with a group of my friends. I was out on a picnic on the outskirts of Damascus with my friends. And one of our friends was missing. One of our friends was missing. And I really wanted him to be there. I didn't have a mobile phone. So what did I do? He said, I moved away from all of my friends. I moved away from all of my friends and hid away from them. 
And I said, I made a dua. I said, Oh Allah, you used to allow Sheikh Ahmed Al Harun to ring people to their houses with the receiver that he used to carry. With the receiver, with the phone that he used to carry, and it never used to be connected to a line. And he, he used to ring people in their houses. He used, and he said, Oh Allah, today I don't even have a receiver. And I want to phone someone off my hand. I want to phone someone off my hand. Please, please allow it to be. He said, I punched in the person's number and I put my hand next to my ear like this. And he said, the phone begin to, began to ring. And I rang his house, spoke to him and I said, we're sitting here at a picnic. Please come and attend with us. He said, I put the phone down and the person came and he attended the picnic with us. How is this possible? This is possible if we know our aqidah, if we know our belief. Our belief is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who carries sound. He is the one who has ultimate effect and impact in this world and in this universe. None of us can do anything. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that does everything. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that does everything. Is that clear? And once we understand the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll understand that by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what can happen and what can be done, then when we look at these miracles, we won't think that they're impossible. Why? Why do people think that these miracles are impossible? Because they judge them by their nature and by the capacity that they have. They do not judge them by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has of His absolute power and might. So the Allah, the Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala that is allowing for my sound to reach all of you in this room, if he wants, he can allow for this sound to travel much further. Like Ibrahim alayhi salam, he built the Ka'b al-Musharrafa, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he built the Ka'b al-Musharrafa with his son Ismail alayhi salam. After building the Ka'bah in the middle of the desert of Makkah al-Mukarramah, what did Allah say to Ibrahim alayhi salam? وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ يَأْتُوكَ بِالْحَجِّ Allah said to Ibrahim Now call the people so that they may come for Hajj. Ibrahim said, Ya Rabb, this is an empty desert. There's no one here. If I call, who shall hear? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, You make the call and I will make your voice reach. You make the call and I will make your voice reach. Ibrahim salam said the Adhan in the empty desert of Makkah to Mukarramah and the scholars said that that voice reached the souls of those who were not even yet created in their physical forms. In the higher realms, their souls heard the voice of Ibrahim salam, and anyone who was destined to make Hajj, however many times, they said Labbaik that many times. So someone who said Labbaik once, Upon the voice of Ibrahim salam, that they heard when he, when he made that sound from the empty desert of Makkah, Allah made his voice travel and reach all of those souls. Right? So the ultimate impactor in this universe is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have no impact. We, have, we can't do anything. Right? And when we remember this, and when we know this, that we have no power, we, we cannot do anything or change anything except with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's when we will realize, that's when we live in the true excitements of our religion. This is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله كنز من كنوز الجنة. This statement that there is no change and no power save with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Prophet said this is a guns, it's a treasure from the treasure of, the treasures of paradise. It's a treasure from the treasures of paradise. So there's no effect in this universe except that, that effect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates. Except the effect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates. So his hearing sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extended his hearing beyond the hearing of the <coughs> And likewise, when he wishes subhanahu wa ta'ala, he extends the hearing of the believing people beyond, he extends the hearing of the believing people beyond the hearing of normal people. 
one of the great scholars of Islam, one of the great awliya who migrated from India to Makkah al-Mukarramah. His name was Haji Imdadullah Muhajir Makki rahmatullah alayhi. Haji Imdadullah Muhajir Makki radiyallahu anhu. He migrated to Makkah al-Mukarramah, that's where he lived the remainder of his life and he passed away there. One day he was sitting amongst his students. He was sitting amongst his students and suddenly they saw that one half of his body became absolutely drenched in water. One half of his body became absolutely drenched in water. The students asked and said, Sayyidi, we see that your entire body, half of your body has become drenched in water. Why is this? And he said, I heard the call of one of my students who was traveling in the ocean on a ferry, on a ship, who was traveling in an ocean uh, on a ship. He, he said my name and he said, Sayyidi, my ship is about to sink. Come and help me. He said, my, sink, my ship is about to sink. He said, I went to his assistance and I pushed up the ship from within the waters. This is why you see half of my body wet. This is why you see half of my body wet. Right? Now, people who judge this by the capacity that Allah has given them as a human being, they say it's impossible. But people who see that we have no capacity, we have no power, we have no effect and impact in this world, it's rather the power and effect and impact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates that they see all of this to be so simple, so easy to occur. Is that clear? Likewise, Imam al-Junaid radiallahu anhu, the great Imam of the two sects. He was the great Imam of the two factions. He was the great Imam of the two parties. He was the great Imam of the two, two groups. The group of the people of Tasawwuf and the group of the people of the Sharia, the scholars of the Sharia ah and the scholars of Tasawwuf, both groups deemed him to be their Imam. Imam Junaid al Baghdadi radiallahu anhu, he used to walk upon water. Right? And he, was, he would take his students always, uh, also along with him to walk upon water. Is that clear? How is this possible? Why didn't he drown? Why didn't he drown? Because the law of gravity is governed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The law of gravity is governed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And someone who has faith in that this law of gravity is governed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wants to walk over water and not get drowned, he won't get drowned. But someone who doesn't have that faith, that this law of gravity uh, is governed by the law of gravity, they will sink every time they will sink. Is that clear? Except that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates. And then the Shaykh radiallahu anhu he moves over to speaking about the blessed head of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the blessed forehead of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On page 14 of the English version, uh, the Shaykh said, وَأَمَّا جَبِينُهُ الْكَرِيمُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ فَقَدْ كَانَ وَاضِحَ الْجَبِينُ وَهُوَ مَعْنَى قَوْلِ عَلِيٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ صَلْتُ الْجَبِينُ وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ وَاسِعُ الْجَبِينُ وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ عَظِيمُ الْجَبْهَ وَكُلُّهُ بِمَعْنٍ وَاحِدٍ On page 14 he said, As for his blessed brow, it was broad and full. This is what Ali رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْ meant by describing it as smooth or in another narration wide, or in another narration large. They are all, uh, they all mean essentially the same thing. So his blessed forehead, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, was wide and it was broad. Wide and it was broad. And this is why Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, when she spoke about the blessed uh, forehead of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she said, فَلَوْ سَمِعُوا فِي مِصْرَ أَوْسَى فَخَدِّهِ لَمَا بَزَلُوا فِي سَوْمِ يُوسُفَ مِنْ نَقْدِ If they had heard in Egypt, if they had heard in Egypt the description of his blessed cheek sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they wouldn't have given anything in wanting to pay for Yusuf alayhi salam. وَصَحْبُ زُلَيْخَ لَوْ رَأَيْنَ جَبِينَهُ لَآثَرْنَ بِالْقَطْعِ الْفُؤَادِ عَلَى الْيَدِ and if the friends and the acquaintance of Zulaikha had seen 
the blessed forehead of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then they would have cut their hearts rather than their hands. They would have cut their hearts rather than their hands. This is what Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha said about the blessed forehead of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa barak wa sallam. Wa kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam azimu al-hama wa huwa ma'na qawli alikin dhakhmu al-ra'as and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his blessed head was large sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but it was large in proportion to the rest of his blessed body sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and anyone who would look towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam every part of his body would seem large to them why? because of the haiba because of the awe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had placed in his physical figure sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that all the parts of his body would seem large to the one who would look towards him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even though all of his body was in proportion sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it was in proportion to uh, uh, each other and then the shaykh radiallahu anh said wa kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam azajj al-hawajib azajj daqq al-hajibayn fi tool sawabigha min ghayri qarn he said his, his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's head was large, which is what Ali radiallahu anh meant when he described him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as having as, uh, an ample head. His sallallahu alayhi wa sallam eyebrows were long and arched, long and arched, but not so long that they actually met in the middle. Right? Now the scholars have a difference of opinion as to whether the Prophet Sallallahu blessed eyebrows uh, were connected or they were not. Whether they were connected or they were not. There is two groups of scholars. There are those, and all of this is in accordance to the description that is mentioned, uh, the different descriptions that are mentioned concerning the eyebrows of the Prophet Sallallahu So some, some of the scholars said that his blessed eyebrows were actually connected, right? But the hairs that were in between were so light that they could only be seen if the Prophet, if, if, the, if there was some, if there was some sand upon the Prophet sallallahu face, blessed face, and that sand actually sat upon the hair that were in between his eyebrows. That's when those hairs could be seen. Other companions, because these hairs were so light. They described him وسلم, as not having hair in between his two eyebrows. So some said that his blessed eyebrows were connected and others said his blessed eyebrows were not connected. Those who saw him from a distance would see that his blessed eyebrows were not connected. And those who saw him from a close, they would see that his eyebrows were connected. So there was uh, this difference of opinion concerning that. And concerning the eyebrows, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he uh, instructed all of us not to play with our eyebrows, whether that's men or women. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses those who, 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 who design their eyebrows. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his curse upon them, right? those who shape up their eyebrows. The scholars have said, and we heard from our teacher, the great Faqih, Shaykh Adib al kallas that if there is a hair or a few hairs that are away from the line of the eyebrow, they may be removed. But to thin the eyebrows and to shape the eyebrows and to shave the eyebrows and to design the eyebrows, this is extremely haram. And the Prophet wasallam cursed such like people whether they are from the men or they are from the women right in the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam this would mainly occur amongst women but now we have young people who go to the barbers they have a haircut and they also have slits in their eyebrows this is also haram to have, to have slits in the eyebrows this is also haram why is this because we are playing with the features that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran concerning the shaitan, the shaitan said, Wala udillannahum, wala amurannahum, 
فلا يبتكن آذان الأنعام ولا آمرنهم فلا يغيرن خلق الله. The shaytan said, guess what? The shaytan took a qasam by Allah subhanahu wa taala too. He said, ولا آمرنهم. This lamb, this lamb of qasam, and the noon is the noon of of emphasis, the noon of ta'kid, al-thaqila, the heavy emphasis noon, the emphatic noon, right? That makes. He said, ولا آمرنهم. By Allah, I shall surely instruct them. And what will they do? فَلَا يُغَيُّرُنَّ خَلْقَ اللَّهِ And upon my instructions, they will change the creation of Allah. They will change the creation of Allah. Messing about with the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us against doing such like things, right? And encountering the wrath and anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Encountering the wrath and anger. Then this is what the shaitan does. He wants us to change the form upon which Allah created us. And the Prophet said, towards the end of time, there will be men who would want to look like women. And there will be women who would want to look like men. And this is exactly what's happening in our times. Right? And if we do not beware, and if we do not caution ourselves, and if we do not protect ourselves, and if we do not warn ourselves against these prophetic warnings, right, then we are calling upon the wrath of Allah to descend upon ourselves. We are calling out for the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to land upon us. And then we say, we, we make dua and it's not accepted. We, we give sadaqah and it's not accepted. Why? We, we do so much of this haram and then we ex expect everything that we want to be given to us instantly. It's a give and take. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, Ud'uni. Uh, Allah said in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ If my servants ask you about me, then inform them, I am close. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ I accept, I hear and I accept the call and the dua of those who supplicate and those who ask. What, what does Allah say next? فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ Then Allah said, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي Then let them, let them be people of istijaba. And what's istijaba? People who accept the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our du'as will only be accepted if we accept Allah's way. If we become people who accept Allah's way, that's when Allah in return will accept our prayers. Allah said in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O believers, istajeebu lillahi wa lirrasooli iza da'akum. Reply to the call of Allah when Allah and His Messenger call you. One companion, he was praying, he was in salah, he was in namaz, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called him. He called him once, never had a reply. Called him twice, never heard a reply. Called him thrice, didn't hear a reply. This comp companion completed his prayer and he came to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet said to him, Oh so and so, why did you not reply when I called you? And the companion said, Ya Rasulullah, I was praying. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Have you not heard the words of Allah? Istajibu lillahi wa lirrasooli iza da'akum. Reply to the call of Allah and his messenger when they call you. Reply. Likewise for dua, there's a condition. What's the condition of the dua being accepted? فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُولِي Allah said, let them know I'm close. And when someone calls upon me, I accept. But what's the condition? فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُولِي Let them accept my way. Let them reply to my call so that I reply to Teacher Habib Ali, he made a beautiful point. He said, if you look into the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look into the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you find attributes that have opposites to them. At attributes that have opposites to them. So one of the names, one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Muhyi, which means the one who gives life. And he also has the opposite, Al-Mumit, the one who gives death. We have an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Mu'izz, the one who gives honor, the one who raises, 
And then you have the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Muthil, the one who abases. Right? Like this, we have opposites in the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Habib Ali, he said, but there is one attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that doesn't have the opposite of it. And what's that attribute? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Qareeb, he is close and he did not describe himself to be Al-Ba'id, the far one. He described himself to be Al-Qareeb, the close one, and he did not describe himself to be Al-Ba'id, the one who is far. Is that clear? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is close to us. وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ And we're closer to them than their jugular vein. Right? But when we realize this closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we become people of istijabah, when we become people who reply to the call of Allah, right? We reply to the call of Allah and Allah will hear our calls. This is why in prayer every day what do we say? Sami Allahu liman hamida. Allah hears those who praise Him. So which means what? We have to become people of praisers. We have to become people of Rabbana lakal hamd. Lord, for you is the praisal, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies to our calls. But if we don't become people of a reply to Allah's call, why do we expect Allah to reply to our call? Why do we expect Allah to reply to our call? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the blessed eyebrows of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Huh? Some say they were connected, some say they weren't connected, and they were curved, right? And they were long, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa barak wa sallam. And the instruction that he's given all of us is not to mess with our eyebrows, right? And that men should not want to uh, dress or look like women, and women should not want to dress and be like men. This is something natural. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know the Sahaba must have been stunned. They must have been puzzled at some of the things that the Prophet ﷺ said and what they heard from him. Why? Because they were living at a time when mankind was living in, uh, in a natural, humane way. Where human beings could not understand why men would want to look like women and women would want to look like men. Right? And the descriptions that the Prophet ﷺ gave, such perfect descriptions that he gave, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum could not comprehend them. Right? They could not work out why men would want to look like women so much and women would want to look like men so much. But we see it in the world. Exactly what the Prophet said. And he warned us against. And when we approach these things, we are approaching the wrath and anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that correct? And then the Shaykh radiallahu anhu moves up, uh, over to speaking about the blessed nose and the blessed mouth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with which we will continue insha'Allah in the next lesson if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us life and he gives us ability subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and insha'Allah we will have